Imagine, if you will, that the world we live in, or on, I should say, in this case, is hollow. That there's another world inside the world that we know, and the shape of that world, the, the makeup of that world, the build of that world varies depending on which theory you're listening to, which theorist you listen to. But tonight I wanted to get together with Eric, and, and, and we wanted to talk about this hollow earth theory a little bit. From a child born into this world, we are taught what to believe. Close-minded, we become fearful to be deceived. Still, we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door. The art of the storyteller, conjuring tales of legend and lore. History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten, and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Eric? Yes, Bill? It's been a week or so since we've been able to talk. It has been. Uh, no, Missed you, buddy. We didn't get canceled by Disney. They tried. I have to be honest, kind of did that as a joke, but... You know, at the same time, life got in the way, and COVID got in the way, and all kinds of other things. Got in the way. Life got in the way so, from our so podcast. We did have to skip a week, and, you know, that that happens. So, now, Hollow Earth, my first exposure to the idea of Hollow Earth was with Dungeons & Dragons. I don't know if you remember the Hollow Earth campaign setting. Yes. And that was for base Dungeons & Dragons, and inside the world that all the races of D&D lived on, there was another world. And there was a, a sun suspended in the middle of the planet. And then you walked around on the inner crust and all these cultures that had long since died out. You know, there was a, a, a Roman equivalent and a caveman equivalent and a Mesopotamian equivalent. And all these ancient cultures and they had dinosaurs. And, and, and Yeah, they had dinosaurs and things like that. It was, it was the things that disappeared from the surface of the world had all migrated inward to live on this inner planet. And I got to admit, that was fantastic idea for a D&D game. I loved it. We played many an adventure set in Hollow Earth. Now, see, I thought you were going to say Jules Verne and Journey to the Center of the Earth was your first exposure. No, I, I mean, I'm familiar with the story. I think I watched some movies based on it when I was growing up, but it never really occurred to me that that was the same concept. My first exposure was uh, probably a little-known cartoon or little-remembered. I'm showing my age here. Land of the Lost. And I say cartoon. It was actually <laughs> a very cheesy, looking back on it, but at the time, like live a, action. Like a Sid and Marty Croft deal? Yes, Sid yeah. and Marty Croft. Yeah. Well, and then you have the, the Will Ferrell movie, which is, you know, classic oh, yes. cinema. <laughs> yes, classic <laughs> stuff there. Had the whole Brandon Fraser version, Journey to Center of the Earth movie. There's been a lot of there, references to it. There's a lot of legend and lore about there being essentially an underworld. Religiously speaking, almost every culture had some sort of underworld that they believed literally existed beneath our feet. From the Christian version of hell to, you know, the Roman and, and Greek Hades and, and the realm, you know, of the souls underneath our some Indian tribes even had uh, underwater caves that they believe was the passageways for, for those uh, deceased. Yeah, no, it's, it's sort of an interesting topic. And then as we get to the end of it, I definitely want to talk about Nazis and the Hollow Earth. So I'm going to tell you, there's like some that spin. interesting theories there as well. So kind of get a, get us started here. You know, there's, there's a lot of myths and legends, like we said, a lot of different creation stories. You know, the ancient Greeks literally believed there were vast caverns underneath the surface of the earth with entrances leading to the underworld. And and that's where you would find Hades and, and you know, the souls of the damned. Uh, the Celtics believed in a cave that they called Kruikon, or Ireland's Gate to Hell, basically, a mythical cave from which strange creatures would emerge. The Angami Naga tribes of India believe that their ancestors emerged from su just such a place, a vast underground realm Mexican folklore tells of a cave in a mountain about five miles south of Ojinaga, and, and that this is supposedly possessed by devilish creatures who came from inside the earth. Native American mythology, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that. It is said that the ancestors of the Mandan people emerged from a cave on the north side of the Missouri River. That's not too far from That's there. pretty close. There's also tell of a tunnel on the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona near Cedar Creek, where it is said that uh, the lands inside are inhabited by a mysterious tribe. Uh, the Iroquois ancestors are, are supposedly, you know, 
travelers from an inside or our, our hollow inner earth. And the Hopi elders say that there's an interest to the underworld that exists in the Grand Canyon. So there is a rich history here of mythology that says that we have these these vast underground, and we're going to say tunnels, we'll say vast underground caverns, but there are people who do believe in that version of a hollow earth from the Dungeons and Dragons thing, where there is a smaller sun suspended in the center of our planet. I've actually got some information on that. I'll kind of jump in here. What we do know, Earth has four layers. We have the crust, the mantle, the outer, and the inner core. Quite honestly, at least to this point in age of what we know, there's been no successful expedition below the inner core level of that. That we know that's of. been properly documented. Let's that's say been that. Pro- I like that. I like that. That's been <laughs> properly documented. Uh, therefore, it's it's a lot of speculation on what is actually there. I mean, we've talked about the oceans and stuff and how vast that is in areas that we haven't explored yet. And we're just, all puns intended, scratching <laughs> the surface of what lies beneath there. Now, you had mentioned the Dungeons and Dra- Dragons uh, version and the the extra sun, if you will, that was there. I came across a, a semi-common scientific belief Four and a half billion years ago, Theia was another planet about the size of Mars, and it is believed to have slammed directly into Earth. In doing so, it's theorized that both pieces, Theia as well as the Earth, broke away into sections, and then over the next several thousand years were drawn together in space, and that is what creates our moon that we have today. Now, it would stand to reason this planet the size of Mars, Theia, if it slams into Earth that hard, breaks away chunks of the Earth, that maybe, just maybe, part of that got embedded inside the Earth. So it is this belief that uh, some theorize uh, hollow Earth gained some popularity in the integrity, because if these pieces could have shattered and some of them been embedded in Earth, with the magma and lava that are already there at the center of the earth. But what if part of that heat source is ultimately a sun that is suspended in the center of earth, hollow earth, if you would. So it was funny that you mentioned that because that was something I came across in in some of my research. Well, you might find this hard to believe. And I don't know what kind of scientist the guy was. But one of the first people to sort of put forth this idea that there was an inner world was Sir Edmund Halley of Mm -hmm. Halley's Comet fame. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, Edmund Halley proposed in 1692 as a way of explaining magnetic anomalies that he had detected, I guess, or that they had discovered. But he proposed that the Earth might consist of a hollow shell about 500 miles thick with two innermost shells and an innermost core, each of those with its own magnetic poles. And these shells would rotate at different speeds around each other with atmospheres separating each shell from the next one. So it would really be a series of inner Earths. According to his his belief. So, like, if you did a cross-section of Earth, you'd just see multiple rings. Multiple rings, yes. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, these atmospheres were believed to be luminous and inhabited. That way, the people or the creatures that live there would have some sort of light. And he also believed that these gases escaping at the poles was the, uh, bo- the borealises. I remember seeing that, yes. Now, over the years, this, this image had changed into uh, the center being just one large cavern with a small sun suspended in the center, like we've talked about before. Now, Leclerc Milfort, uh, he led a journey in 1781 to a series of caves near the Red River, or above the junction with the Mississippi River, uh, and hundreds of the Muscogee people came with him. And according to him, the, the ancestors of the Muscogee had emerged out of the earth here in ancient times, and he claimed in his expedition to see caverns that could easily hold fifteen to 20,000 family units. So these would be big caves. Wow. wow. Now I'm I'm thinking about this and, and a lot of the reference and the theories go back to, you know, obviously volcanic, volcanic tubes, volcanic tunnels. You know, you'd mentioned the, the Borealis, the northern lights could be those gases coming out of that. But obviously it makes sense that those would connect up to caves. And of course here in Missouri we, we're not deprived of, of natural caves everywhere. So uh again, it it if you stop and you have an open mind and you start thinking about it, it Kind of makes sense. Yeah. It, it's, well, and I mean, just scale. The mathematics of scale on this one. The planet is so big. So huge. I'm not saying that there's another sun and all that stuff, but the amount of open, available space to explore. There's got to be know, caverns something and caves. there. Yeah. 
I mean, may not be dinosaurs and and uh, you know deities and forgotten tribes, but there's got to be something there. I saw a headline the other day that said scientists had broken into a cave that had apparently been sealed off from the rest of the world for thousands of years. And of course, the first comment underneath that, the little you know editorial lies, was a. Uh, Please just seal it up and leave it alone. This is not the time for this. Because <laughs> I don't know how many I don't know how many movies you get to see, but anytime somebody breaks into a cave that's been sealed for it's thousands of years, it's not good. I just watched a movie called The Silence on Netflix, which was they unleashed this horde of killer bats that basically devastated the entire world. So yeah, let's just not mess with these sealed caves. <laughs> well, and all joking, but uh, you know the whole Godzilla King Kong kind of relates back to those oh, yeah, creatures there, there's a big hollow that in the in the new ones there's a big hollow earth element to that so yeah i mean we're surrounded with it in the movie industry so after leclerc's expedition mathematician Le- leonhard euler he continued this and he's the one that really started to push the single shell to hollow earth with the small sun at the center that was kind of his contribution to this particular topic and then we move on to captain john sims jr who was a hero of the war of 1812 and he moved west afterward to trade goods around the St. Louis area. We well, always like to bring it back home when we can. Absolutely. Starting in 1818, he began to suggest a world consisting of a hollow shell 810 miles thick with openings 1,400 miles across at both poles. These openings would even come to be known in mythology as Sims holes, which is what they're referred to today uh, in the mythology of, of the hollow earth theory here. Now, he suggested four inner shells, each with openings at their poles, and the inner earth was absolutely capable of sustaining life. Uh, And he believed that the inside the earth would be, in his words, quote, stocked with thrifty vegetables and animals, if not men. Mm. He also believed that this particular model would apply to all the planets, which, you know, with our understanding of the other planets, probably fairly unlikely for, like, Pluto which is not a planet. Poser. And then Jeremiah Reynolds would become a a disciple of sorts to Sims, and uh, he would continue on with his work. Uh, He delivered lectures all all around the country, at least, on the Hollow Earth idea, and he himself went on an expedition to Antarctica looking for these Sims holes. Now, uh, he missed joining the Great U.S. Exploring Expedition of 1838 to 1842. Then author Rodney Clough continues to write about the hollow earth even after that, and I got a couple quotes by him, quote, My conception of the hollow earth, based on my research, is that the shell of the earth is about 800 miles thick from the outside to the inner surface. Suspended in the center of that hollow is an interior sun that is divided by day and night sides. So he kind of convolutes the idea. In the Dungeons & Dragons representation, the way I'm familiar with it, that sun doesn't have a day-night cycle. It's just daylight. It's just daylight all the time. You know, the idea is you have these people, the, these educated folks, and they go out there and, and they have these thoughts and, and they believe that there's this hollow earth. And you have, you know, Native American origin stories claiming that the people, you know, migrated from this inner world. So what would be in this inner world exactly? There's a lot of discussion about that. I've got a little tidbit I'd like to throw in there. Something I stumbled across about nine years ago, actually on June 13th, 2014, uh, a group of scientists were re- researching the Earth's mantle, announcing an astonishing find that has somewhat rocked the world, so to speak. They have found what they believe to be a vast body of water, get this, three times the volume of all of our known oceans combined. This is contained about 400 miles inside the Earth. This shakes that foundation of what scientists thought they had known, a lot of that early speculation. Now, scientists in 2014 were able, they they drilled as far as they could, which was actually only about eight miles. Now, at eight miles, it just got too hot and they had to stop. So, to put that into perspective, that is eight miles of drilling of over 400 miles of very, very, very tiny amount so we really know nothing beyond that eight miles into that vastness of 400 miles but here is this gigantic volume of water again three times the size and volume of all of our oceans combined now early speculation i remember reading was the earth is just full of magma and lava that's what's in the core that's it how can you have that much water that doesn't evaporate? So that that kind of starts to shake things a little bit. Well, and I, I still think it's, a, you know, I'm going to use the phrase again, mathematics of scale. I mean, our planet is huge. Again, there's no way we know everything. Now, 
we wouldn't be doing this podcast justice if we don't talk about that kind of a vast body of water. What could be living, swimming in that megalodons or whatever? Well, I can tell that you've never read any of the Meg books because <laughs> they do touch on that. Meg by Steve Alton, which is the book that the movie the was movie based, was based off, off of. And and I'm going to plug those. I mean, I might as well. I love those kinds of things. The, they're very much in the line of Jurassic Park kind of mo- stories. They are just the campiest, you know, giant shark killing spree books you could ever want to read. But yeah, there's a whole one of them where they tap into, I think they call it Hell's Ocean or something like that. They basically do find that underneath the ocean there's a like a passageway to a, an inner ocean where all these prehistoric creatures are trapped and have, have you know, evolved separately from the rest Goes of the world. Goes back to the whole Godzilla thing and everything we were talking about, yeah. So yeah, yeah, if you read those books, you've definitely heard some something along those lines. What could be inside the the hollow earth, Eric? Now extinct creatures like dinosaurs? In the land of the lost. Possibly. That, yeah, that, that possibly. was there. New evolutions of now extinct creatures. That one seems if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have a hollow world and, and these creatures are gonna migrate, that seems pretty likely. I don't I don't think you would see like dinosaurs from a million years ago. You know, millions of years ago. I think it'd be a new evolution yeah. of, of something yeah, like hopefully that. Hopefully they, they, they evolved to some degree. Now what about our little gray friends? Well, UFOs. Aliens and their UFOs. Maybe entire bases. You know, you want to go back to like the second episode that we ever did. Giants are said to exist. I do like my giants. Uh, dwarves, dragons, and other fantasy races. <gasps> I again I had a I had a friend who sort of believed that Tolkien was not uh fantasy but was history, so who who's who knows? Ascended masters of esoteric wisdom. I like that one. That's monks, a mouthful. Monks that have achieved enlightenment. It's okay, we're done with this this surface world right here. Descendants of the Vikings. I've heard that one. The Vikings did a lot of traveling. They, they showed up in places that were unexpected. Some of these uh, vanished tribes of entire nations of people. Maybe it was Eden. Maybe this is where Adam and Eve were exiled from. So who's, who knows what we'd find if we discovered it again? And Eric, I said we'd get there. Maybe even Nazis. Nazis. Now, I got to admit, I specifically sought out this story. I knew it had been mentioned, and I, I like it. It's a ridiculous idea, and then I'll, I'll talk here in a moment about how it ties into a movie, because you know me, I like to watch movies. You're, are you talking about the Sam Elliott, uh, the man who killed Hitler in Bigfoot? No. Oh, no, oh, different movie, movie different movie. <laughs> but there is a story that alleges that Hitler never killed himself. He instead fled to one of the polar openings. Uh, some in the Nazi leadership believe that we were on the inside of a hollow earth the the earth we lived on was actually the inside oh wow that's trippy and that it was centrifugal force that acted as gravity to keep us on the surface now mind you not all nazi leadership believe this some believed in the more traditional hollow earth model now hitler escaped his bunker via an underground tunnel to an isolated airstrip and from there they flew an unmarked plane south to the south pole and they flew through the Sims hole they found there to uh, to evade Allied justice. Now, is this all theories? Or is there any diary, documentation, paperwork of I this mean, plane or this, anything? This is all conspiracy theory. Okay, 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 okay. So according to the Hollow Earth Research Society in Ontario, Canada, Nazis are still there. Allegedly discovered after World War II, more than 2,000 Nazi scientists from Germany and Italy had vanished. And along with that, almost one million... German and Italian citizens. That's a whole lot of people who just disappeared. That's a lot of people. That's a lot. I also believe that they've continued to work on their military aircraft designs. And we talked a moment ago about, I don't know if you remember, have you ever heard about the, heard about the Nazi bell? No. It's essentially a UFO. And if they had continued to work on that and perfect it. Uh, but it says, you know, the theory says that they, they continued and finished their plans for UFO-type aircraft. And it would also explain the Aryan-looking UFO pilots that are sometimes described uh, by contactees. They call them the Nords, but they are tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. That sounds an awful lot like what Hitler was aiming for. Now, again, I believe this is all conspiracy theory, but there is at least one documented Nazi expedition to attempt to find an entrance to the hollow world. At least one. At least one. So, uh, I mean, if you're familiar with your Nazi lore and, and the, the conspiracy theories and whatnot, I mean, they were interested in all these these things like that. I mean, they were searching for the Spear of Destiny, the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, they really believed that they could bring metaphysical things into the, the, the Reich 
to make them successful. More powerful. And obviously, if you can seize upon all these religious artifacts and wield them, and then you must have God on your side, right? So now, I got to take a moment. I don't know if you've ever heard of the movie Iron Sky. I have not. Iron Sky is a movie that implies that at the end of World War II, the Nazis fled to the moon and established a moon base. And there they... Wow. They, they developed technology until they'd be able to come back and conquer Earth the way they wanted to. Now, there's a sequel to Iron Sky called The Coming Race. Iron Sky, The Coming Race. At the end of the movie Iron Sky, one of the surviving Nazi sympathizers goes down to Antarctica, goes through a, a portal kind of thing, and comes out in a hollow Earth and is greeted by a Tyrannosaur riding lizard Hitler. <laughs> now, the sequel. Alrighty then. If that sentence alone doesn't get you on board, the sequel is everything that you think it's going to be from that description. (laughs) But basically what it boils down to is that the Nazis had invaded this hollow earth and they they took over and that's where all the lizard people that we talk about come from. And that the you you have like a lizard Hitler and a lizard Mussolini (laughs) and, and all these different historical figures. It's 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 really ridiculous. But interesting, but interesting. So that, that that idea is out there. I mean, it's in pop culture. The story about the Nazis being in, in the Hollow Earth, there's a very similar, I believe it's a novel, um, an Indiana Jones novel, actually, where Indiana Jones discovers evidence that the Nazis had fled to this hollow world and, and he went after them. I, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of pop culture, a lot of speculation, a lot of... A lot of things like that. I, I love all of that. I love the conspiracy theories. But I'm going to reel us back in a little bit to uh, a documented case, and uh, that is of Admiral Richard Byrd. Admiral Richard Byrd, uh, 1930s time frame, famous polar explorer. He was the first in the 30s by ship, and then later in the 1940s, flying recon expeditions over the North Pole. Now, his first expedition uh, was back in 1926, when Admiral Byrd made his maiden trip by ship there to the North Pole, then a small plane that he and a pilot by the name of Floyd Bennett uh, later made a 16-hour quest flying over. Why? Some people may ask. Why in the world would they want to fly over, you know, the North Pole? Well, keep in mind this was before the war, and they were basically trying to see if there would be a good foothold, a good place for a military base there, which, as we know, they did make a military base there, and it had its uh, advantages. Now, years later, Admiral Byrd uh, was also asked, since he did such a good job apparently at the North Pole, to do the same thing over the South Pole. So literally, he traveled and explored both ends of the world. I got to say, this was a brave man. He was a tough old bird, by all means, all puns intended. B-Y-R-D. Yeah, yes, B-Y-R-D. <laughs> These areas can reach negative 90 degrees with winds up to 200 miles per hour. Some of the most absolute unsavory environments in all of the world. But on one such trip in 1947, Bird had recorded in his private journals of something he encountered that could not be explained while he was flying over the North Pole. Something that he called the center of the great unknown. He stated he flew over this lush green area surrounded by this Iceland, these Iceland conditions that I mentioned that was common for the North Pole. But with this area, this huge area where it shouldn't have been, this would be similar to that of an oasis in the desert, but obviously kind of an oasis in the Arctic, so to speak. Now, he later flew expeditions over the South Pole, which I had mentioned, in means to prove a theory that he might also find something similar at the South Pole. On one particular trip to Antarctica, he made another finding, a huge pit, a hole, he believed was to the center of the Earth. And it was around these openings that heat generated from deep, deep below, uh, bellowed up and created this kind of unnatural, lush, green forest that he allegedly had seen and reported, as well as his co-pilot. Now, he, he went a step further, stating that in official military debriefings that he believed technology advanced races lived there and that they had strange sorts of crafts that allowed them to fly back and forth from both the North and South Pole in speeds that were absolutely unfathomable. He also speculated to some of your talkings that Vikings could have sought out this area. And again, if you're a Viking in those type of conditions and you come across this 
lush habitat and a fort. Why in the world wouldn't you stay here? Obviously, there's heat and everything. But he speculated that, uh, you know, not necessarily aliens, but other cultures could also live there. Now, the military debriefed Admiral Byrd for some time and then basically released him and just told him, you know, quit talking about this stuff. <laughs> now, you could take that in one or two ways. Quit talking about this stuff. We've known about it. We don't want anybody else to know. Or shut your mouth. You're, you're an embarrassment to the military. So you can kind of take it either way. But that is a documented case that we, we can't deny. And he says that he could see that. Now, I mean, Bill, maybe I'm going out here on a limb, but we don't know about the what's in the center of the earth. As you said, gigantic, enormous amounts unexplored. We know there's, or we theorize, there's some heat sources there. We know volcanoes exist. Is it really that far of a stretch to think that some of that heat could bellow up through a hole? Well, you know, it it wasn't all that long ago we had this sinkhole ec- epidemic. Mm. And I want to say it was in Japan, and it, it may have been China, but it was it was an Asian country. I don't remember which one now. I, I, I stumbled upon it in my research. I didn't make a note of it. But they had actually had a sinkhole open up, and it revealed a forest underneath. Oh, wow. Uh, with trees that were hundreds of years old. So, uh, you know. How'd that get there? Yeah, how, how does that happen? <laughs> so the idea of there being a polar opening that leads to this hollow world, I would assume you'd have to have a way for heat to get out if you have a trapped sun. The other argument, you know, who knows? I mean, again, we've, in in our lifetime, the Antarctic and the Arctic have been covered in ice. We don't know what's underneath that. Now, if you go and you spend some time on Google, not and it doesn't even have to be very much, you will find where people are discovering things in polar ice all the time like Google Maps that don't and all look that. right. Yeah. Yep. Um, Weird giant, shapes. and Giant caves, things that look like they could be crashed aircraft that should have not exist. So, and again, we know volcanoes are real, very real. So, okay, a volcano, if at the very least, popped up in one of the Antarctica's. Okay, that's very believable. I hate to do this, of course, but the idea of a hollow earth has sort of been disproven. Tentatively, in 1740, by Pierre, and I'm going to it's French name, Bouger, I'm guessing. And then definitively, in 1774, by Charles Hutton, in what he called his Schihalion experiment. And I'm, I'm sure I said that wrong, too. But it began with an expedition from France to the Chimborazo volcano in Ecuador. And then after climbing the co- volcano, conducted what is called a vertical deflection experiment at two different altitudes. And this helped him determine how there could be anomalies in Earth's gravitational pull. And remember, Earth's magnetic pull was sort of what started Sir Edmund Haley down this route. Right. So here we have this guy can, is, has explained how you could come up with these variations. Uh, and he considered that, that his his discovery had essentially rendered the, the hollow Earth theory invalid. And, of course, in, over the years, the, the study of seismic waves uh, and the way they are documented to flow through the Earth indicates, one, the, the Earth is filled mostly with solid rock, mantle, and crust, with a liquid nickel-iron allo- alloy outer core and a solid nickel-iron inner core. So, science tells us there is no hollow Earth. But, I mean, we can we can believe. That's, that's, the, that's why we do what we're doing here, right? There's been a lot of scientific stuff that's been disproven through the years. I'll just say that. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we took it as God. I remember, well, not really, but when the Earth was flat, that was scientific. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm not that old. But. I was going to say, you're not that old. And obviously, the Earth's not flat. You know. well, it depends on who you ask these days. <laughs> We've talked about a lot of the theories tonight, but uh, I just wanted to kind of, we'll wrap things up here with some of the bit, I'll, I'll say wilder ones. You know, you had mentioned Nazis dec- discovered the hollow world back in the 1940s, World War II, retreated there, uh, still maybe in bunkers and deep bases uh, during their research. Uh, number two, alien life forms have a vast civilization where they fly spacecrafts in and out of these giant holes back and forth north of the South Pole. Number three, part of an ancient planet that, that crashed into Earth billions of years ago that I touched upon. And maybe, just maybe a piece of that is is residing there in the center, creating a version of the sun that, that exists and allow things to grow. Number four, a- Egyptian gods or even if how you want to believe the whole Stargate, uh, maybe alien, uh, they, maybe that's where they have retreated and they live there in hollow earth. Number five, we got the whole land of the lost, the atmosphere in the center of the earth where dinosaurs have continued to, to breed and evolve. And, and that's now what they call home. 
Uh, number six, the Vikings found that opening in the center of the earth in, in the Greenland area and retreated there to be left alone and continue to live. Uh, another one we didn't actually touch upon, but I stumbled across, was uh, there's a theory that the ten lost tribes of the Bible are also speculated to possibly reside there. Uh, number eight, the, the northern lights, as they are called, are nothing more than the gas pockets released from these holes, or maybe volcanoes, if you want to put it in that aspect, uh, proving that the earth is hollow to some degree and has something down there. And number nine, it's the home of Godzilla and the titans like featured in the movies that reside there. And it explains why they can vanish for hundreds of years without being seen or heard. A lot of speculation, a lot of things to think about. Some we may scoff and laugh at a little more than others, but again, some of them, it, it kind of stands to reason there has to be something or there has to be a void of something. I don't doubt there's hundreds, thousands, millions of miles of caves and there may be caverns big enough to contain entire continents, for all I know. I'm not going to say that's not out there. The right. whole right. hollow earth with the suspended inner sun and all that. I mean, I'm more of a scientifically minded guy. I think we, we can get away from that. But again, it does make for a good story that there are Nazis living beneath our feet. So. Maybe the Vikings and Nazis are working together with the aliens. Wow. <laughs> we hope that you've enjoyed tonight's little bit lighthearted exploration to hollow world and the journey to the center of the earth thanks for listening y'all uh summon nazi ship well summon nazi ship nazi ship that that's a magic spell that you never want to use <laughs> i summon the <laughs> nazi ship that's going in the outtakes <laughs> okay. we'd like to give a shout out to our first uh paying sponsor raven's loft that's our family shop here located in uh, Lebanon, Missouri. It's your one-stop gaming, vintage toy, and collectible shop where you can find Star Wars, Transformers, G.I. Joe, comics, vinyl records, role-play gaming, Magic the Gathering, and so much more. We're located here at 223 West Commercial, downtown Lebanon, and also in our second location, uh, also here in Lebanon, at the Heartland Antique Mall. We'd like to thank Ravensloft for again supporting Nightmares on the Lost Highway. I want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me and uh, <laughs> using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing. And thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms, uh, the final edition, if you will. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to, to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love, but we're, we're happy that there are people that enjoy it as, hopefully as much as we do. Thank you very much.